So I am meeting here to get today with uh, Bill Carpellos, uh, who is a, an assistant professor in the Faculty of Business and Information Technology, and he's going to talk to us about uh, serious gaming and the interplay between serious gaming and PBL. Um, I give you an opportunity to uh, say a few more words about uh, your, your particular work, Bill, uh, before we start it with the interview. Sure. So as, as you mentioned, Roland, I'm in the, uh, the game development program, game development entrepreneurship program at UOIT. So I've been here for about five years now, and I'm actually, my background stems from computer science. But while at UOIT, I've, I've really started exploring for the past four or five years um, virtual reality and in particular serious gaming. And, you know, you can think of that as, you know, gaming for the application, towards the application of education and training. So I'm involved in a number of uh, serious games-based projects, including, um, you know, particularly uh, those for training uh, surgeons and medical professions, uh, professionals. Um, I have a number of projects which we've delivered, including a, a serious game uh, for knee replacement surgery procedure training. So that's looking at the cognitive steps involved in knee replacement surgery, not so much the technical, the technical de uh, details. We just recently completed a study at Mount Sinai with uh, several colleagues from there. The results are very promising, um, and we found that the game itself was very effective, particularly for novice trainers, not so much for the um, advanced trainers, but for novice trainers. So we're in the process of, of you know, analyzing those results a little bit more. Um, you know, that work has, has continued on into looking at or applying that same framework that we've developed for um, cardiac surgical uh, training as well. So we're working with um, cardiac surgeons, uh, Fouad Moza in particular from uh, Sunnybrook uh, Health Sciences Center here in Toronto. So we're moving along with that. We're also looking at some, we've recently, and we will be conducting a larger study in, in the summer, in the months of Ju uh, July and August, we're looking at, or we've developed a, a game, a serious game for diabetes numeracy training. And this is in particular for uh, pr providing adolescents, adolescents or teens uh, with, with the relevant numeracy skills they need to manage their diabetes, which is actually a big problem. So we're doing that uh, together with a number of doctors at um, SickKids. And the game itself is actually done, and I can send you a link, as I, as I mentioned earlier, to some video outlining it. Um, and like I said, we're running some studies in the, um, over the next couple of months. So that's just a snapshot. There's a couple of other projects I'm doing, but what I'm what I'm really interested in is not so much in building these serious games, but I'm actually looking at what effects or when we look at when we look at a you know a gaming environment or a virtual reality environment, we're looking at multimodal environments. So we have auditory cues, we have visual cues, haptics potentially. I'm looking at how these all come together and how they interact and what effect that has on our knowledge transfer and our retention. And particularly, what effect realism and levels of fidelity have on knowledge transfer and retention? And you know, do, does it necessarily mean that the greater the graphics or the greater the, the auditory or the spatial sound cues that we employ, does that have any implications for the learning that takes place? So that's an ongoing project of mine right now. I'm working with, <clears throat> with a number of uh, collaborators on that. I have a number of students working on that specific topic. So that's kind of in a nutshell what I'm doing. Can you hear me at this point, Bill? Yep. Yep. Okay. Good. I, I had a meltdown. Uh, we went blue screen on the uh, uh, on the tablet, and so I'm back to uh, the other machine, and it's okay. Working. Good. Sorry for for the uh, the brief interruption there. We'll be able to edit this out. Um, so let's let's go to the other side of um, what you were dealing with, or what we're dealing with in this course. And can you tell us a little bit about what your understanding of problem-based learning uh, is? So, I, I mean, problem-based learning, my understanding, you know, it, it stemmed from the, the medical uh, training uh, back in the 60s at McMaster. Um, but I see it as, you know, I don't see it specific to medicine by no means. And I think it's applicable to a variety of fields, including gaming and game development in particular. And I'll talk a little bit about how we incorporate that in uh, the gaming program at UOIT. So I look at it as basically a, you know, you're bringing together an interdis interdisciplinary team of students as well as experts 
and they're tackling or they're working on a real world problem. Um, that real world problem itself is hopefully well defined. Um, and in the process of actually working on that problem, students have the opportunity to conduct research, to collaborate, to discuss uh, amongst themselves, obviously, and to, to explore. And I think ultimately they have an end goal and they're working towards that end goal. And I also think the problem itself should be, well, as I mentioned, well defined, but also uh, not a problem that they have a solution to readily available on their own. I mean, I, th I think it's something that they have to work towards. So it's something that they're working to collaboratively together uh, towards this end goal. So that's my view of problem-based learning. But I don't see it specific to medical research. I think, it, I think it's applicable to a wide variety of disciplines. OK, you, you were talking about uh, having a well-defined goal. One of the things that uh, we've talked about in this particular course is um, setting scenarios, context within which problems can be identified. So when you're saying you, you've got problems that are, are hopefully well-defined, do you actually give the problem itself to the user or whoever's going to be uh, making use of uh, your particular game? That's a good question. And I mean, in the, the serious gaming work that we're involved with, I mean, you know, and I'll, I'll use the, um, uh, the, the knee replacement game, for example. Um, the end goal is, to, you know, we have an end goal, um, and it's to, you know, well, the ultimate goal of the game is to, to learn or, or to learn the cognitive uh, processes involved in knee replacement surgery. So the steps of the, the surgery, each step after the other, and, and the, the specific tools involved for each step. But while accomplishing that goal, students are able to explore. So they don't, uh, you know, there's multiple paths they can choose to reach that goal. And it's up to them to actually choose and decide where to go, you know, different different forks in the road, so to speak. It's up to them to decide which to take and then to that goal. But then also they have to realize that there may be consequences for taking a particular step as opposed to another. So they, they, they don't necessarily, I, I think the, the key here is that they have the option to explore. And I think that's where the, the value in these, these virtual environments or these serious gaming environments come in, where you do have that inherent option to explore. I mean, if you know, there, there, there's multiple paths you can go down, and I think there's consequences, or perhaps one path may be more, you know, maybe better than another for, for you know, however you define better. Uh, but I think the, the the key here is that the students have the option, or the trainees have the option to explore, and of course they can try multiple paths, and it, they can by actively exploring, they're able to determine what happens. Right. Okay. Um, and, and obviously, the, the consequences that you were talking about are less detrimental than if they were trying to explore on live patients, et cetera. Absolutely. So there's value in, in being able to have that freedom without the extreme consequences of dealing with human beings' lives, et cetera. Absolutely. I think that's the value in simulation in general, be it virtual or, or physical simulators. I mean, there, there's, there's drawbacks and benefits to both. But you do have that option to to explore. You're able to do things in the in, in the the virtual the, the virtual world in particular that due to time constraints, safety constraints, you wouldn't be able to do in the real world. And I think that's where a lot of the value is. So you're able to actively on your own explore these options and see, you know, what can happen as a result. Where in the real world, you know, although perhaps you could do it, you don't want to do it, or there may be severe consequences in doing so. Right. Um, um, one of the other too, if, I, if I may just add, Roman, um, one of the other things that you're able to do with um, and some of the other work we're doing for critical care providers, um, interprofessional education for critical care providers, where we actually bring teams, uh, teams of health professionals together, and their their task is to stabilize a patient. The patient can actually there's two modes to the patient, and one is you know where we have artificial intelligence controlling the patient based on the responses of the the trainees. You know things happen, the, the patient responds accordingly. But we can also have the patient, uh, a patient control can also be given to the instructor or the quote expert. Um, and the expert can then determine what happens to the ba patient based on student, uh, student actions. And that's, again, going back to your previous question, all of a sudden we have a problem where the patient, the, you know, the, the patient may not necessarily respond to in the manner that the students or the trainees expect. So we're able to throw that, you know, kind of curveball in there, and they, you know, unforeseen circumstances or unforeseen uh, events due to their actions. Right. Okay. Um, can we 
go up one level in terms of theoretical uh, kind of uh, a piece, and I'm I'm thinking here about the major implications in terms of using PBL within this kind of environment as a mode for learning. And can you make some comments about that? So using, well, I think I mean I, you know okay so. And, and if I understand the question correctly, you, you're, we're looking at, you know, if you look at problem-based learning, I think, you know, serious gaming and virtual environments, it's not, I think that they're, they help facilitate problem-based learning. So inherently, they don't necessarily, they're not, I think they have to be designed appropriately so that they can facilitate problem-based learning. Um, I don't think on their own, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't look at, it's not the only, sol I mean, it's not the solution to problem-based learning. It's one you know, one of many tools that you can employ in a problem-based learning um, approach. Um, so, you know, I think with, it also, it also allows you to actually create these scenarios in a virtual world where in the real world it may not be, may not be practical, again, due to the, the, the factors that we talked about earlier. So again, I, I see these, I see these serious games or these virtual simulations um, as facilitating a problem-based learning uh, approach. Um, so they have to be, you know, obviously the scenarios have to be, I think, constra you know, again, it goes back to the same thing. The problem has to be well-defined, in my opinion, um, the scenario properly scripted, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, that's actually moving in, in a, a direction that I'd like to explore a little bit. But uh, before we go there, can you um, describe as succinctly as possible a specific scenario or a specific uh, series game that, that you've been talking about that we will be able to provide a link to uh, uh, within the WebCT environment uh, later on in the course. Sure, absolutely. There's there's actually a number I can I can uh, provide a link to. I can provide provide uh, uh, some links to videos outlining just some gameplay of the the knee replacement uh, series game that I mentioned. So you get a glimpse of what I'm talking about in terms of graphics, what it looks like, what it feels like. You'll look at, so you can see some of the interactions. Um, so that'll be a video. And I can also send you a video of the, um, uh, the series game for uh, diabetes numer um, numeracy training. And that's, the, that's in the form of a, that's a really interesting one. That's in the form of a uh, tower defense game, a very popular strategy type game. And, you know, we, we're using an implicit or primarily an implicit model here, where we're not we're not really mentioning diabetes at all. So we're using a metaphor or an analogy, um, and there's no mention of diabetes, death, or consequences of thereof. Um, so it's a really interesting, um, you know, it, it's a, it's a really interesting uh, model we're using here. And of course, we'll have to determine how effective it is, or we we will determine how effective it is once we we complete our user studies. But I could send a link to that, and you know, I can send some. Further info, even links to papers outlining the, 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 the knee replacement serious game. I have some, some good literature on that that I can provide you with. Thank you very much. I think that will be interesting for uh, the students who are in this, this course.